We are now streaming live, apparently. Exciting. We got the message. Yeah. Uh, that's, it's still, there's a delay between the streaming services in here, and it takes a few minutes for it to get all set up. So I try to start it a little bit early after this morning's uh, chaos of the 1230 panel. So <laughs> chaos. Yeah, the streaming on that one did not go according to plan. So yeah. ah. sorry about that. everything else. Everything can go wrong, go wrong, go wrong, go wrong, go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. <sighs> so we'll get started officially in another minute and i'll do an intro uh to the con and uh then i'll hand it off to kathy okay mm -hmm. how is it going so Amanda? We're all here? yeah uh, yeah okay. to the con and uh... i i'm am i i i i have to see three the three of you and a bubonicon icon on my screen Right. No, Did you want to change your name from Jim? No. I don't know if we can. Um, you well, can upper right. Um, but the the person who's running it has to do it for you. Um, no, maybe let me look you can in. under participants for yourself. I'm not sure. But usually in a webinar, if you click the upper right little the little dots above your picture. I did it. It's done. Okay. Thank perfect. you. I don't have my screen up. I don't like looking at myself. I, I, I find that extremely distasteful. One does not normally sit staring at one's own face in reality and... Uh, yeah, even really shiny glasses are scary. Huh? Even really shiny glasses, when you're talking to someone with the reflective glasses, you're like... <laughs> so I well, I just don't, I just don't it feels unnatural to me to watch myself talking. I mean, we don't do that in real life. No, we don't. And if we do, yeah, well, we do. <laughs> yeah, but we don't look ourselves in the mirror. We just talk to ourselves in our heads. That's a different thing. Because then you can have like four or five people oh. in there. See, I'm going to be like, I actually kind of like it, but um, that's because it keeps me accountable. So I don't do anything weird whilst people are looking into my home. I remember exactly. that. Um, I okay, well, it's uh, six o'clock now, uh, so we'll get officially uh, started. Um, so welcome everyone to Bubonicon 2020. Uh, this is the Creating Worlds panel, Fun with Flora and Fauna. Um, if you are an attendee, you can ask questions in the QA. Uh, if you're on YouTube or Facebook, I'm also monitoring for questions there. Uh, but I will hand it off to Kathy. Hey, everyone. Welcome. My name is Kathy Kitts, and um, I my NASA mission was Genesis. I have since retired, and now I'm a writer. And uh, so I would like everyone to please introduce themselves to you, and I would like you to add one extra piece of information, and that's this. On a scale from 1 to 10, with 1 being, say, um, an urban fantasy where it's everything just the same except for one creature to all the way to like Dune, where if you had to print your author's notes, it would come in at a metric ton and you would kill an entire forest. So from one to 10, where are you in the world building scale? So please introduce, introduce yourselves. Who would like to go first? Maybe for Becky. Becky, we'll make Becky go first. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Becky Chambers. I am a science fiction author. I live in the very north of Northern California. Uh, I'm best known for my Wayfarer series, uh, and I also have a number of standalone works, both extant and upcoming. On the world building scale, I would put myself at a solid eight. All right. Wonderful. Anybody want to volunteer? Okay, I'm. Uh... S.M. Sterling to publish, and, and Steve to uh, people who know me. <clears throat> I'm a science fiction and fantasy writer. Um, I've done a lot of alternate history, uh, including both the fantastic and uh, the harder varieties of that. Um, how I rate on the world building scale depends entirely on what I'm working on at the moment. Right now I'm doing an alternate history, it's hard alternate history, and no fantasy elements, and it's set in the 20th century of Earth. So on that, I'd be a one. You know, there's not even any um, uh, odd creature in the shadows like a lot of uh, urban fantasy stuff, unless you count Teddy Roosevelt living, living longer. Um, 
on the other hand, I've written um, science fiction set on other worlds where the whole ecology is different or scrambled up with um, uh, earth stuff dropped into it. And I'd rate those at a seven or eight. So depends. All right. And Jane. No. And I'm Jane Linskold. I've written, I forget, 25, 26 novels. They're all over the place, science fiction, fantasy, heavily mythic. There's, you're cheating, Steve. You're stealing yeah, my This puzzle. doesn't make you hat down. <laughs> People this is familiar. Like cat. All right, I need a cat. Um, <laughs> okay, this is unfair. I'm going to have to whip out a cat right now. I okay. unfortunately don't have a cat, so. <sighs> All right. You call yourself an author um, and you have no... I know. In any I case, know. I'm a, I'm a I've written everything from, from space opera to uh, whatever. Um, I write all over the place. I get bored if I, if I stick with one thing only. Uh, like Steve, I'd say it's a sliding scale, but um, because I come from a scholarly black background, I always, ha, huh, I always uh, research exhaustively and um, this is Rory, he's five months old. Um, and uh, so I guess my best example is when I was asked to be the keynote speaker at a science conference and I was uh, viewing the poster sections and someone had done a poster session on wolves. I had read every book on her bibliography. So even, even when I'm writing fantasy, I research exhaustively. So we would give you a 10 for that one. Uh, I've got a lot of books on wolves. And I've been <laughs> licked on the face by a wolf, which uh, definitely counts as intimate research. All right, wonderful. And I too am on the sliding scale. Um, I had one where it was basically my university, but exchange students could actually be from another planet all the way to where I completely geeked out and I actually calculated the amount of parts per million of CO2 that I needed in my atmosphere to get the temperature that I wanted, mm. because I can. And what's so great is if someone actually challenges me, <clears throat> I get the research, I'm ready for it. Yeah. All right. So my question, my first question for you is where do you start when you begin your world building? What's the first thing, what's the spark that gets you going for your next universe? Question for you, Kathy, are we going to stay on the focus of the topic, which is flora and fauna? If you, yeah, uh, it, please, if we, it, it's, we'd like it to be a little bit more flora and fauna if you can, but sure. we're not gonna limit you too much because sometimes if you're doing an alternative history, it's here. Right, okay, just wondering. Um, I'll, I'll go back to wolves for an example. Steve, um, the, uh, In the Firekeeper books, I had have some very large animals. So one of the thing, and some of them are carnivores. And one of the questions is, of course, if you have very large wolves the size of ponies, what do very large wolves the size of ponies eat? So um, <laughs> whoever they want. Yes, I know, Steve. <laughs> um, but uh, but so. Going, you know, looking when I was looking at the panel topic, it said, "Can you do? Do you just throw the monster in and not think about what its support system is?" And my action is no. I, I think about um, even my relatively beneficent wolves. What were they eating? What supports an ecosystem where uh, you have a lot of oversized animals? And my answer was to give them a continent. And, uh, and, and leave it off stage as to what they were doing. But it's there in my world building and I think helps me write more realistically. Yes, absolutely. Becky. Yeah, I, uh, I always, start, my work is very character focused. So I, I tend to start there and then reverse engineer my way back. So when I'm writing alien species, um, I'm usually, I usually start by riffing off of um, whatever animal trait 
I am particularly focused on at that time, uh, be it, um, you know, it could be squid and the way they change color, it could be uh, reptiles and the way they shed their scales, doesn't really matter. It's usually something, something like that, something I pick up in like a PBS show or a museum or a book or whatever, where I'm like, ooh, that's neat. Let's blow that up to a civilization level. Um, and in that, then I have to sort of work backwards and figure out, okay, what's the, what sort of planet gave rise to this species and what animals do they live around? What is their natural habitat like? Um, so I'm usually building the world to suit the characters rather than the other way around. That's good. That's interesting. And Steve? Uh, yeah, before I get started on my own stuff, which is of course endlessly fascinating, uh, I'd like to um, remark that recently they dug up from a permafrost uh, deposit in Siberia, a, a wolf skull about 40,000 years old, and it's 16 inches long. Uh, just by comparison, that's not quite twice the length of uh, a large wolf today. And it's the same length as the skull of a, a medium-sized grizzly bear. So that was probably a very large wolf. <clears throat> yes. Uh, moving on from that to my own stuff, what I usually do is I get a flash of something, um, a person, a character, a situation, an action scene, and then I work back to, uh, to give it solidity, uh, you know, to provide an entire world that will lead up, which I, I think is uh, uh, germane to what... Uh, to what you said. Um, and I love doing research. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a geek. I wanted to be a historian until I found out that you, what you had to do to get the tweed jacket with the leather patches on the elbows. Um, and I, I just read compulsively all the time. Uh, a lot of it's history, but it's also anthropology, uh, ecological history, stuff like that. Um, two examples, I did a collaboration with Dave Drake it's set on a planet where the native ecology is roughly uh, inspired by the late uh, Cretaceous uh, Earth. Mm -hmm. Lots of dinosaurs. That was fun. I was obsessed with dinosaurs as a small child who isn't. And, uh, you know, I got to show them like being quick and intelligent with feathers and all that sort of thing. Um, and I did an alternate history called Conquistador in which the... Uh, effectively the person who discovers an alternate uh, world with no Colombian exchange is a rewilding geek and uh, dumps an enormous uh, quantity of uh, African wildlife into a Western North America that's otherwise more or less like our 1492. And uh, everything breeds enthusiastically and spreads like, uh, well, rabbits in Australia. Except that, you know, North America's ecology actually does have a lot of holes in it because of the um, Pleased to see the extinctions of the megafauna. So, you know, cheetahs and antelope and elephants and all that sort of thing just fit in perfectly. That's why uh, American pronghorn antelope are so fast. They evolved in an environment with cheetahs in it. Um, nothing that we've got now can come anywhere near catching them. But cheetahs, yeah. There you go. There you go. And, and riffing off that idea, what is most important for you as an author? What would you, if, if someone wanted to be an author, uh, specifically what in world building do you think is most important for them to consider? The most important thing to consider is the type of story you want to tell. Um, mm -hmm. With science fiction in particular, I mean, it's a spectrum, right? You've got um, like your science fantasy, you know, your Star Wars and your Guardians of the Galaxy and whatnot on one end. And then you've got, you know, something like The Martian on the other end. And on most of it, falls somewhere in between there. Mine is a little more in the middle. Um, so I, th I think before you get lost in the, the delicious weeds of world building, you have to decide where it is on that spectrum that you want to fall. Because if you're, tell if you're telling, you know, fantastical cosmic adventure where you have, you know, swamp planets or, you know, here's the ice planet, here's the lava planet, whatever, you don't need to explain that because that's just a particular type of story and we all know what that is, and you don't need to say why. You can if you want to, like if you want to bury that in the notes somewhere, absolutely. But um, so I, I think the, the, before you even get into the world building, you need to decide what flavor it is you're going for, because otherwise you can get really bogged down in details that don't matter to the sort to type of story that you want to tell. Yeah. I'd like to rip off of what Becky said. Um, sorry, Steve. Um, I think you're absolutely right. This isn't a disagreement. 
but I think you need to make care certain that uh, you don't throw the reader out by deciding that you can do the lava planet with no particular reason why. Uh, some I was thinking about world, how world building can ruin a book mm -hmm. um, or lack of world building thought. I was thinking of a book I was sent to blurb years ago that was set in Santa Fe and the person who wrote it thought they had done their research, but they put mesquite in the San Diego de Cristos. They, it's way, <laughs> look at Steve's face. Um, it's way, way, way too far north. It's way too high altitude and threw me out of the book completely. I never could believe anything else because, um, so yes and no, make sure it's believable. Whatever flavor you choose to tell, make sure you make that flavor believable. Don't say, oh, I'm just telling um, soda video game. Uh, I don't really care. Uh, and Because your reader is going to know you don't care about the world, care about the place, care about anything. So I'd say yes, but make sure you have a reason if it's a ice planet or a lava planet or whatever. Stargate did a very good episode that on that. They go through the Stargate, they come out in a cave in a glacier, they crawl up through a crevasse. It's this frozen wasteland with a blizzard blowing in their teeth and one of them exclaims, it's an ice planet. And it turns out they're 20 miles from McMurdo Base in Antarctica. <laughs> even How about you, Kathy? You're a geologist. Um, what do you, where do you start? Uh, for me, it's always character. It's always character based. Once I get a character, I mean, I follow um, James Gunn, you get the idea if you get a character um, with a problem in a place. And so I want my character and what's his problem or her problem or its problem. And then I figure out what the world is like. But because I am a geologist, I, I and I made a, I cracked the joke at the beginning, but that's really what I do. Did that little number 240 parts per million get in my book? Absolutely not. But that does not mean that I don't know it. Because by knowing that, I know what the weather's like, what the seasons are like. And that's actually one of my pet peeves, which leads into my next question. We'll let Steve do this, but I'll, but I'll piggyback off this and let Steve answer both questions at once. And that is, give me some of your pet peeves about things that really bug you. And one of mine is that if you have a type of story that really does rely on your world, make sure your world works. And that's, that's what bothers me when I get thrown out of the story because I love the story, but it's so preposterous as you were just saying with the Santa Fe and the Mesquite. You know, we got yeah, a thousand, you, you know, it's, it, that's just a thousand percent off. I know there's no such thing as a thousand percent, but you know what I'm saying. So Steve. Two things I like to say about world building. First, that it's good occupational therapy for lunatics who think they're God. Um, because, you know, everything's connected and you it's like pulling on a thread in a sweater. Uh, I tried once to, to alter the the basic laws of momentum for the for the purposes of a story series I was putting together. And at 3.30 the next morning, I realized I was I was trying to replicate Newton and uh, reinvent calculus. And it was just, you know, and I have a serious math phobia. Um, <laughs> the other thing is that it's uh, world building is like an, uh, um, an iceberg. 90% of it is underwater. The fact that it doesn't get into actually put explicitly into the book doesn't mean that it doesn't structure the book. You know, so you've got to know a lot more than you put in. And believe me, I tend to overdo putting stuff in. Um, like climate, you know, if there's going to be an abrupt transition between a desert and something much wetter, there's got to be a reason for that, unless, you know, magic. But you know, that, that sort of thing just, just peeves me. And desert and, and cities in the middle of, of barren deserts with no way of getting food, you know, that throws me out too. Or, you know, when we're talking about ecologies and, and uh, you know, what, what does this predator eat? Or why does this world consist exclusively of large things with teeth? Um, you know, the same thing applies to, you know, human and, and character interactions. You know, you can't have everyone be a nobleman, um, you know, or or if, if there were wizards all around throwing fireballs at each other, it's not going to look like anything historical. You know, so all that stuff has to has to tie together. I did a, a series once um, 
it's set in a world very much like ours. It's alternate history, but they discover in the course of the 20th century that Venus is a fecund swamp planet with dinosaurs and Neanderthals and barbarian princesses and fur bikinis. And Mars has canals and ancient cities and decaying civilizations and that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's essentially the old solar system, but updated. And I tried to figure out a way to make this scientifically credible. And one of the things I had was a geologist, actually a paleontologist with a secondary in, in geology on the, their Venus, looking at strata and fossils and stuff like this and saying, this makes no sense at all. And I just thought that added a, a nice a little bit of color. It turns out that aliens did it 200 million years ago. So there you go. Deus Ex Machina, but it still works. Becky, please. Uh, my pet peeve is uh, astronauts taking off their helmets. I, I really don't, I don't care. Like anything else is fine. Like if you can explain it or you can lampshade it or hand wave it, I don't care. But if you're, if, if the astronaut says, oh, the air is breathable and pulls off their helmet, um, they're dead. So it, <laughs> it really, I don't, I don't care how breathable the air is. I don't care what your oxygen sensors say. And I don't care what flavor of science fiction it is. Please leave your helmet and your suit on at all times. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, I love that. Anything else? Why are they, why are they automatically dead? Because I mean, the, the, the spores, I mean, not to bring it down, but the entire situation in the world that we live in right now should exemplify why you should not breathe air that you're <laughs> yeah, unaccustomed yeah. to. Um, yeah. And that if you are the first <laughs> within a closed ecosystem, uh, don't take off your helmet. No, I, I wasn't disagreeing with you. I was just thinking that oh, was a sure. very good point. Yeah, yeah what was your, what was the, what's the thing that tips you over? And for you, it's just the, the allergies, the, the, you know, it could be a million things. Can you? Right, you know, I don't want to have hay fever on, uh, on another planet. That'll oh yeah, I've read, wild. I've read books where people do the, take the helmet off and end up with uh, micro fungi growing in their lungs and, exactly. and up their noses Absolutely. and stuff like that. Yeah. I think my pet peeve, I've got a lot of them, but I'll just pick uh, horses that are cars. Oh. Um, uh, it just, I'm not even a horse person. I've, you know, I, my last riding lesson, I was probably 12 years old, but even I know they, they aren't cars. Um, and uh, post-apocalypse apocalyptic worlds where the gasoline still is viable and worked and hasn't separated and degraded. So, uh, you know, just yeah, that's, that, that bothers just me too. anything that violates high school level science that a person should be able to handle rivers that flow uphill, you know, and the, the author doesn't seem to realize that they've just described a terrain, you know, they walked in the direction of of the uh, the river was flowing, and the soon their legs were cramping as they mounted the slope. And it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Water flows uphill on your planet. Okay, good for you. I want to, I want an explanation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Since we've kind of done, you know, what our pet peeves are, um, what are some of the stories? To, so we can go the other side. What are ones that work for you? What are some that you thought really did well with flora and fauna? Um, you know, like. Pitch Black did not, because you have these carnivores that eat everything that apparently only eat space travelers. What do we they eat the rest of the time? So that would be an example of what not to do. What is an example of one where it kind of worked for you? You read it and you're like, okay, I can believe this world and I can now enjoy the story. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Perry Anderson. Steve and I seem to be in unison. You go. <laughs> okay. Um, just to the point that uh, Jane raised, uh, Harry Turtledove did a story. Uh, it's an alien invasion story. But at one point, one of the uh, viewpoint characters has to travel cross country and there's just an extreme shortage of gas. He pours moonshine that he's bought into his car. This is in the 1940s. Cars had broader fuel intake capabilities then. And it works for a while. And then the engine stops working and he gets a mechanic to look at it. And the mechanic says, holy shit, what did you put in this thing? You know, so that was a nice, nice touch of verisimilitude. He has to walk the rest of the way to Chicago. That works. I was going to say a, a story that made a huge impact on me when I was a beginning science fiction reader was Paul Anderson's. It was published um, in two different 
four, t- under two different titles, War of the Wingmen or The Man Who Counts, depending on which version. But it basically deals with um, three crashed human travelers on a planet where they can't eat. They can breathe the air, but they can't eat anything. And they're slowly starving to death. And the grand, I, I don't want to provide a spoiler, but um, it, it's not just good world building. He worked it into the story. I know Steve knows the story. And the ending where Van Rijn saves the day. Uh, it, it, <laughs> it, yes. Oh, yeah, I remember that one. It's, it's yeah, so yeah. gorgeous because it uses all of this. It isn't just setting. It isn't just um, we're on a world and we can't eat anything and, and we're starving and, and we are trying to make friends with these two different groups of aliens to try and get somebody to get us off planet. He worked the fact that they did not belong to that biosphere into the story in the most brilliant, wonderful, phenomenal way. And it, it really shaped me as a science fiction reader when I read it in uh, his collection, uh, The Earth Book of Stormgate, as, oh, this is how alien planets should be done. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't just be setting, it should belong to the story. Very yeah. good. That's an excellent. I, I'm so tempted to say how that one ended. It's just brilliant. How it ended, Steve? Yeah, you Don't know. Say it. Don't say I it. Know. We'll get complaints. Don't do it. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, it's been published for 40 years. Yeah, and we'll still get complaints. <laughs> <laughs> and, no, and, right. and, you know, so we tell everybody, read it. Go read it. Yeah. Go, it is really great. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why there's a current trend among Um, younger readers of science fiction, younger writers of science fiction to say, why do I have to read all this old crap? And then they get very excited when they think they've invented the wheel. And as um, Joe Haldeman's Filk song, uh, the science fiction editor's lament, puts together very well, uh, there are a lot of things that have been done very, very well that you can use as exciting educational and jumping off moments. So I'm not saying you have to read everything, but some of that old stuff is damn fine. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think that's one reason why it, it, it um, I mean, it, you have the copy of the book because I know she got up to your library. Do you have it? No, Steve? Anyway, but I think that's, a, that's very important. And it's um, so true that a lot of people are very disappointed when they're not getting published at first. And that's because they, they have a good story but it's not as good, it's already been done. And so it's something that you really do need to do some reading. It's, I know sometimes it's painful, like why do I have to read this old dead guy? Um, there's a reason, this story has survived 60, 70, 80 years because there's something good in it and it's worth your while to spend time with it. And so, Becky. Um, the comment about food made me think of um, in uh, outside of books, uh, the Mass Effect uh, video games have just really, really wonderful world building. And there's a detail in them that I particularly love, which is that of Dexter protein, uh, which is that some of the alien species of the galaxy, um, I am not at all equipped to discuss molecular chirality on the fly, but uh, we can only use uh, proteins and sugars that are L versus one direction. Exactly. Yeah, Thank, versus you. Yeah. Thank you. Not my field, so I appreciate it. Um, and but there are species in the galaxy, the games posit, that uh, use the ones that face the other direction. So you have to have different types of food, and this nice. actually draw uh, drives plot in a lot of uh, in in certain quests and scenarios where you know um, the humans on the ship might have a lot of food. Um, but the Quarians don't, and or or the other way around, um, and it's just it's this little tiny detail um, that pops up throughout, and and I, I really love it for that. Mm-hmm. But it absolutely works, right? I mean, that's yeah. the, and that's and that's what and the reason why it's so important is because, like you were saying before, Jane, it's that it's not just having it in the world. Your world's problem is your problem is based on the reality of that world, and that's what elevates it. I mean, that's a good um, one one time, uh, I was running a role-playing game for a group that included an awful lot of authors, including George R. R. Martin and uh, Walter John Williams and 
Melinda Snodgrass and uh, it's been a while, but oh, Patty Nagel, PG Nagel. And uh, Patty was playing the quartermaster and everybody was busy saying, oh, we need to bring this and we need to bring that and we need to bring the other thing. And Patty, who had done a lot of research uh, because of her historical work, uh, said, okay, guys, we are hitting the point that we will need camels just to carry fodder for our camels. We are, <laughs> at, the, we are at the point of vanishing camel return. Um, and that's another world building animal uh, and otherwise pet peeve of mine. The stories I love are the ones that take into account that you have a supply chain and that when your supply chain begins to be a supply chain just to supply the things that are supplying the supply chain, you stop. Yeah. No, I mean, that's one thing that, um, you know, like the example of even on a planet where, um, for example, in a lush veldt, predator to prey is one to three, but in the desert it's one to five here on, here on earth. So taking that information and applying it to your world is something that's very important. And I think one person who does this well um, was um, Mary Doris Russell, um, Doria Russell, because she was the one that did The Sparrow. And it ended up being the, the, the cause for the second book, which is by meeting these earthlings, the prey species, which is also sentient, realizes, wait, we don't have to be prey species. And so the entire second book is based on the, the premise in the first part that you have two sentient species and one is preying on the other. And suddenly you get an idea that you don't have to do that anymore. So I thought that was interesting. Anybody else have any other um, stories that, that really attracted them? Mm -hmm. that, yeah. Um, oh God, it was one of pools. Mm -hmm. And the problem was that the humans could eat the local food, but it was just so disgusting to them that it had severe psychological uh, consequences and affected the, the, the internal character interactions. And I uh, can't remember the title, damn it. But that was a, that was a good one. You know, mm -hmm. just, just a personal anecdote. During the 60s, I lived in Kenya when I, I was quite young at the time. And there was a famine on. Um, and, you know, people were dying in large numbers. I remember stepping over the bodies of the dead and dying. Um, and... Um, the uh, United States rushed in famine relief food, and the locals mostly ate maize, posho, maize porridge. That was the staple, the staple diet. Mm -hmm. um, but the maize that they sent was American maize, and it was a different color and texture and tasted different. And there were people who were actually dying of hunger who, who wouldn't eat this weird foreign stuff. You know, so, you know, a lot of the time, there's an old joke that most science fictional aliens aren't as alien as someone from Japan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, a lot of the time, things like just the significance of how food's prepared is completely left out, you know, um, and yeah. it's, it's important. That's a, that's a world building. Food is a world building uh, element that it becomes very easy to integrate flora and fauna into mm -hmm. your work without it becoming info dumpy. Um, what do we do when we go on vacation? You know, we eat, we, we try things. Um, and one of the things I often do for researching, whether it's on this planet or on an alien planet that I know that the biome is a lot like, oh, say, New Mexico or whatever, is I get cookbooks for mm -hmm. the cuisine of the area. And then I cook it. Uh, when I sent part of my novel Legends Walking, also known as Changer's Daughter, uh, in West Africa, I got a, a West African cookbook. And over and over again, when reading West African fiction and nonfiction, I'd come across a, something called, I'm not, I think it's pronounced moi moi, but I don't mm -hmm. speak the language. And it was always described as succulent. And it's like, but it's made out of black eyed peas and what? I made it and by God, it's succulent. Um, but that's another great way to, to do research into uh, world building is to consider 
what people are eating and then use that as a jumping off point as a way of talking about your environment without it being a, a lecture. Right. Mm -hmm. One other thing too that, that I think that most people don't actually handle is the whole idea of waste, human waste. I mean, those of you who have who, um, get an opportunity to, to collect meteorites on the ice in Antarctica, anything you pack in, you have to pack out. And that includes your pee and your poop. Mm -hmm. And that's because you will change the, you will change everything with just your own person. And so people don't realize how much biota are in your, is in your poop. And so if you're in a spacesuit, exactly how long are you in that spacesuit? That's another one of my pet peeves. You're going to have to pee. You're going to have to have a poop and it's going to be in your diaper. You're going to get a rash eventually. So this is also something you get food in, but you also have food out, which also leads into um, my next question, Becky will, um, will have, you, have you speak to this too. And that is what happens when you have fungi, when you have your reaction, when you have your bacteria? I mean, we always tend to think of things that are big and cool, like, I don't know, your big dinosaur that's gonna rip your head off. But what about that fungi? Like there's this fungi that's very scary that takes over ants. Have you heard about this one? Mm -hmm. this Makes them crawl. Things like that. I mean, you can find creepy stuff here, and you can certainly apply that to your to your science fiction or your um, urban fantasy. Um, what if you have a fungus, a smart fungus that are taking over people in your city? Mm -hmm. So, Thank Becky, you. go ahead and start. I, fi I find fungus much scarier than the T Rex uh, for that reason because it's tiny and you can't see it, and it's insidious. And um, there have been um, some great stories based around that kind of stuff. Um, video games again, but The Last of Us is a a zombie like apocalypse game, but it is based around cordyceps fungus and that's that's the contagion um that has destroyed society um and so yeah i think i think bacteria um and fungi are just delightful things to play with they're not something i have used much of in my work um just because i tend to be focused on uh stories of the multicellular level but um but yeah i think there's there's so much um rich material for that i think that's something as far as world building goes, you can absolutely play with, like if you want to talk about, um, you know, it doesn't have to be something scary either. You can talk about, you know, root networks, you can talk about, um, you know, um, the, the composition of the air, you know, what it is you're breathing in when you're, when you're out and about, you know, these things can be symbiotic as well. Um, it's, it's something I haven't played with as much as I'd like to, but it's, it's something I get very excited about for sure. All right. That was one of my objections to the Jurassic Park movies. You know, I, I keep looking at this and I'm thinking, big, fierce animals are a solved problem. You know, lions are not driving human beings out of Africa. Um, and lions are big and fierce. Um, you know, they're a relatively easy problem because you can see them. But we've never been able to get rid of rats, much less bacteria. Um, and, you know, until historically very recently traveling was extremely dangerous and the main reason well one of the main reasons was that the people in the next valley might kill you but beyond that every time you went into a new watershed you got the runs and it could kill you you know montezuma's revenge um and the, you know traveling to a, a really different uh, biome for traveling from the temperate zone to the tropics um a guy called Philip Curtin did some studies on it, which I've used as, as research. Mm -hmm. And uh, Death by Migration was one of his titles. I was uh, actually going to mention that. You got it. Yeah. If you, uh, if you went from, say, uh, West Af uh, from Western Europe or even uh, North Africa to, to uh, West Africa, um, you had a 50-50 chance of surviving the first year. Mm -hmm. um, falciparium, malaria, yellow fever, uh, Africa is where we evolved and our parasites did too. When people left Africa in small groups, they mostly shed the parasites and that's one of the benefits of the new environment. But when you go back there, you know, 30,000 years of your ancestors have had not had to deal with this and the locals have and it's bad enough for them and it's gonna be absolute hell for you. Or when they introduced African and Eurasian um, microbes and parasites and stuff into, uh, into the new world. I mean, you know, Cortez conquered Mexico, but one of the reasons he did it was they were having a bad smallpox epidemic. Right. And, and also the, there's a book, I can't remember the author, maybe one of you will remember, Mosquito is the title. The number, the, the animal that has killed the most humans on the planet over the course of time, animal, 
is the insect, the mosquito, because yeah. of the diseases it carries. And you're absolutely right. You go and you go one valley over and you go from being within the zone because you, you might go up elevation or down elevation, you get a different um, mosquito species and you get a new disease. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Good point. Jane. Oh, uh, what? No, I just want to make sure that you have a chance to speak. Oh, no, I just coming. want to say that uh, fungi, of course, we, you know, you were talking about micro fungi, but macro fungi are fascinating. And Becky alluded to it when she talked about root no networks. Right. Um, this is one of the problems uh, with, with doing research and falling in love with things is, is how do I work this cool thing into my story without making it uh, an info dump? Um, and, but sometimes reading and knowing more than you ever put on the page comes in handy years later. And, uh, you know, since we're doing this as a panel, um, that, that's worth thinking about. Don't, don't just feel that you're reading for the project or researching for the project you're doing now. It might not come in handy until later. Um, and a bit of scientific verisimilitude can really add to even an outlandish conception like say a planetary intelligence. Uh, mm -hmm when I wrote my Artemis Awakening and Artemis Invaded, I wanted to have a planetary scale in uh, intelligence, but I really didn't want it to just be hand wave, hand wave. And we were out with a friend touring the UNM Medical Library, I think it was, and they had a display on fungi and all the cool things they do. And all, as I'm there, mm -hmm reading and reading about some of the larger fruit. I mean, the thing that, oh, mushrooms are so freaking cool. I just love them to, to bits. And, but what you sometimes, if you see a fairy ring of mushrooms, that's yeah. just the outer thing. It's underground. Yeah, that's and, only the genitalia. People forget that the mushroom you see, that's only the genitalia. The rest of the fungus if you see a ring this big, it actually extends out the rhizomes yep. like 20 feet every direction. Yeah, it, it's- Oh my God. It, the, 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 the above joke ground- comes to mind with the, the mushrooms and eating, oh God, okay, never mind. <laughs> so, you know, what I did, Don't go there, but yeah, sorry, that's the truth. But and, what I, so, yeah, so what I did for this planet so that it was not hand wave, hand wave mm -hmm. is make the planetary intelligence supported by the it, it basically, the planetary intelligence was using the fungus network as its, its means. It was a created planet, a terraformed planet, and the people who created it did this deliberately. So instead of having a, um, a, a concept that, okay, we're just going to take the Gaia hypothesis and, you know, hand wave, I rooted it in good solid science, and I felt that the book worked all the better for that. But I didn't you know, if I hadn't been, my mind hadn't been open to things that I hadn't, right. wasn't, wasn't my research moment, I would have missed it. No, um, that's an excellent point. Just read everything, read all the time and see how you can combine it. But we know, like, for example, slime molds, where they spend part of their lives as individual cells and they come together and then they move as a unit and they become sort of a, an intelligence in a way. And so that's an, another example of something. I mean, oh just study earth you can find enough in earth to be able to apply it wherever you you know there's just lots yeah. and lots of things so just keep uh, reading an excellent point an, an author who doesn't planets throughout its history too so it's, and that's particularly yeah, true on ecology so. i was i was going to say um different forms of intelligence and things like that one of the things to keep in uh, mind is we don't have to be you know too earth model um, Werner Vinge in, uh, <laughs> big smile from Becky, in um, both Fire on the Deep, Upon the Deep and Deepness in the Sky, which despite deep in both the titles, they're not related, does a wonderful job of coming up with different aliens. And I'm particularly fond of the Tynes who are separately uh, sort of bright canines, collectively, they become, their mouths become the group entity hands and they become 
smarter than human. And oh, so exciting. Um, I had gotten really, really ceased to be excited by science fiction for a long time. And then Werner Vinge got me excited all over again. Mm -hmm. So Becky, did you have a comment? Oh, just that I really, really love A Fire Upon the Deep. But um, but animal intelligence is something I, I, I dig into a lot and use as creative fuel a lot in my work um, because the more and more we learn about uh, say cephalopods or corvids or any of the other wonderful species we share our planet with. Um, I, I, I love the idea that there is not um, a, a straight hierarchy of intelligence. There are lots of different kinds of intelligence. And I think um, that that is, is really, really uh, rich fuel for, for writing aliens. They do not have to be like us in order for them to be you know, on the same level as people or, you know, worthy of the same respect or attention um, or, or any less interesting, you know, um, they're, they're no less sapient species just because they think a little bit differently. Um, that's something I, I chew on a lot and, and work yeah. into a lot of my stuff. No, I my, think it's wonderful. One thing that uh, you, ought to, you have to keep in mind is that at present, there's only one sap uh, uh, sapient species on earth. Yep. But for most of the evolutionary history of, of just the hominids, um, there were at least three or four different species around at the same time. It's only in the last, what, 30, 35,000 years that that's narrowed down to one. Um, before that, that, you have that, that many, leads me many into different a, types. I think that's an excellent point. And that leads me into to an, to the next question. Thank you for the perfect lead in. How do you deal with evolution in your worlds? Remember that it's a random process. Avoid the teleological fallacy. Uh, it's everything is contingent. There's a cartoon I love. It shows a highly developed uh, velociraptor chipping out a flint hand axe, and above it, an asteroid is about to hit. Um, you know, uh, the fact is that evolution can go in a whole bunch of different ways, and part of it is just sheer chance. Part of it is you know, things coming out of left wing and, re -scr and scrambling the environment. Um, you know, you talk about habitable alien planets, but if you go back 60 million years, Earth wouldn't be very habitable to a human being. Um, you know, uh, for th millions of years after the uh, after the Chichikov Im uh, impact, uh, the dominant vegetation on Earth was like ferns and fungi, because everything else that survived survived only as little tiny relic populations in inconspicuous places. Um, you know, and mostly animals bigger than rats didn't make it through that transition. So the whole thing was essentially like leveled and reset. Um, you know, just a little bigger and it might have sterilized the planet. And things like that happen all the time, you know. Well, like, Permian, if you think of the Permian, that extinction is Permian is because we have 95% extinction rate, trial bites, everything else gone. So we have other models of where we have reset. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and Snowball Earth, the Earth froze right down to the equator at one point. Um, you know, and life itself is a really massive geological force. You know, the fact that there's iron ore on this planet is due to like oxygen generated by algae. So, you know, got to keep that sort of thing in mind. Sorry. Exactly. I mean, you know, oxygen, we forget as a, ge as a geologist, I mean, remember that, that if we sterilized Earth, then the oxygen would go away because all the rocks would absorb all the oxygen. It would react with it. it. would basically rust the rocks. And the only reason we have free oxygen is because that is a symbol for life. So when we look at other planets using um, telescopes or what have you, then we're actually looking for an oxygen signature because free oxygen means something's going on because you can't have it by itself. It's a waste product. And it's a waste product we happen to be very fond of. Mm -hmm. Now I'm looking at the time and they said sometime around here, which, between 45 and 48 after, we're supposed to, to open it up for questions. And so um, I believe- Yes. So uh, here's a question. Um, when in your process does the world building research happen? How do you know where to start <laughs> and when you're ready to move on? And what questions do you ask at the beginning? It never stops. I was gonna say, know. it doesn't stop. Yeah. I know, but when I was writing my first book, I found myself crawling over the floor. I had covered my entire living room with a map of this post-apocalyptic North America, and I realized I was devoting days of thought to the 
patterns of trading and processed flax. And I said, Steve, enough, right? Yeah, at some point, uh, it becomes just a gut level understanding of when to stop. And that's not very useful advice, but you do just learn it as you go along, because sometimes those tangents are incredibly fruitful. Um, and even if it's not for this project, it's something you can use later on, or it'll it's something that'll help you solve a problem three months from now in this manuscript. You may not need it now, but you're going to need it later. But you do need to be able to step back and have a little bit of self-awareness about what you're doing. You know, if you've spent weeks on this one thing and you've gotten, you know, nothing written, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but if you're on deadline, that's not helpful. So for me, what's helpful is being on deadline um, because what stops me from researching or world building is usually looking at my word count and saying, I have five months, I need to <laughs> like get going here. Um, as far as, as when to, where to start, I think just gravitate toward the idea that inspires you most. Um, there is no one correct answer to that. Whatever it is that gets you excited, whatever it is that makes you want to write in the morning or at night or whenever it is you do it, that's where you should start. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I think also, um, not only just the follow the energy, I think would be my answer, follow the energy. And when you kind of run out of energy for, the, for that, then it's time to go back to the story. And also, why are you writing the story? Go back to the reason why you're writing the story. Go back to the characters. We keep saying this over and over again. If you don't have decent characters, no matter how cool your know of them is, nobody's gonna care after the first couple of pages. Even if you come up with this fantastic know of them. What people care about are people, are creatures, or whatever you, whoever your main character is. And so go back to your main character. And I know this sounds kind of funny, but have a conversation with your main character. How much do they need to know? Maybe they're done. Maybe you need more, but maybe your main character's like, no, no, we're good. We can move on now. Jane. Um, I agree, uh, especially with Becky on her comment about follow your excitement. Um, and a technique I often use when researching something I don't know much about is I go and get children's books out of the library because they will define terminology. So when I was doing the world building to set up the cultures for my Firekeeper books, I really wanted silk because silk is nice. I like silk, but that meant I did research into what does it take to get silk? Because in a sense, it's a post-apocalyptic world and the trade routes are down. So I knew nothing about silk when I picked up a grown-up level book. They were using terms I didn't understand. So I got, oddly enough, there were children's books about silk production. And these are really useful because they'll give you glossaries of terms that'll let you research upward. So that, for example, if I was going to write about cephalopods like Becky did, um, my knowledge of cephalopods is in some levels very intimate. I have ripped the heads off of squid and cleaned them and turned them inside out and taken out their nifty little plasticky internal, not quite skeleton stiffener thing. But I don't know that much about squid except how to clean them and cook them. So I'd go and get a children's book about squid and work my way up to do my nifty squid aliens. That's an excellent idea. Definitely go into the juvenile section because um, especially with Scholastic, some of the other big publishers, um, I've actually written a couple of, uh, of um, pieces for those kinds of, of books they're, and for NASA. And they're very important because they have to be precise it has to be a certain reading level. It has to be correct scientifically. And it's actually very difficult to write a good nonfiction um, science book for that, you know, seventh, eighth, ninth grade. And that's a really great, that's a great thing. And if you're just in general, like you just want to throw spaghetti at a wall and get some ideas, I recommend Science News. It's kind of like mm -hmm. the Science Weekly Reader. It's not quite as detailed as things like um, Scientific American. And they're short articles. But what they do is they give you enough information and like, whoa, that is really cool. Oak trees talk to each other through fungus. Wow. Or whatever the, whatever it is. And then you can run down that rabbit hole. But I think that's an excellent idea. If I can add something to that, I think playing to your strengths is also really, really, really important um, or knowing your strengths when you are world building. Um, because yeah, you're building a world and it's very easy for that scope to creep and for you to get into territory that you maybe don't 
aren't familiar with. And there's no shame in not knowing something. And in, in you know, if you got to read a kid's book about it, I've totally done that lots of times. It's really, really helpful. But I think in the writing also be aware of what your own strengths are. For me, my strengths are characters. I'm good at biology, um, anthropology and social sciences. These are all my strengths. These are things that I can read about and talk about um, you know, at a, at a solid level. Physics and engineering are things I understand, but don't have as good of a footing in. So those are things I don't lean on as heavily in my work. I will touch on them. I will research them if need be, but I know it's not my strength. So I don't focus there because I know that's where the story is going to be weakest. So feel, f you, you don't have to build the entire world. It's helpful if you know about all these things, but it, in the end, write what you're comfortable writing. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Do we have another question? Because we have to kind of watch the time. I think we have two minutes. Uh, from Facebook, uh, someone in this uh, is a top, well, slightly off topic, but still world building, just not flora and fauna. Someone wants to know what your favorite way to travel between the stars is. Well, for me, um, I say that gravitons exist. We haven't proved them. Um, Atlas has been very bad at showing anything in the Large Hadron Collider, but I'm still hopeful, and I say that you follow the gravitons. But that's still fantasy. Yeah. Um, don't assume that we know everything about physics. One of the, uh, or any other science for that matter, one of the uh, chastening and enlightening things to do is to go back, say, at 25-year intervals and figure out what the experts thought was possible. And you don't have to go very far back before they turn out to be completely wrong about a lot of stuff. Um, you know, science is progressive. It, it, it makes fewer and fewer mistakes as it goes along, but it still makes a lot of mistakes. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that it isn't what you don't know that'll kill you. It's what you think you know that just ain't so. Um, you know, and that, that is a big problem. Whenever you start building a world or a society or culture, or even, you know, just a group of friends, you tend to carry over stuff that it's just like your unspoken assumptions and they can really trip you up because what you assume to be natural is like often just the custom of the time and place. Uh, I've, I was reading some, through some old Heinleins a little while oh, ago. Steve, Steve, space yeah? travel. That's what? the question was about space travel. Well, I was going to get into a uh, into a travel <laughs> thing, at least, you know, tangentially related. Uh, he's got these air cars and people travel in these air cars and there's no nudity taboo in this future. But husbands are still commuting to work and coming home to the naked housewife in their air car. Uh, you know, that's tripping you up. Uh, for interstellar travel, I just hand wave it because we don't know any means of like very probable interstellar travel right now but that doesn't mean we won't in a hundred years a hundred years ago you know like flight was problematic so yeah you couldn't um a semaphore trying to get a uh what was the example uh, if you are trying to um do a picture like a movie would be just absolutely impossible if you tried to do it in semaphores but basically what is um your baud rate what is your modem what is your router it's using a semaphore Mm -hmm. It's just so much faster that you can get a picture and then you can get a movie and you can get the Zoom. Yeah. Becky. I like wormholes. Worm that's, that's it. That's my answer. I like wormholes. I don't care if we'll ever make them happen or not. I don't care if they're possible. I like them. I've, yep. I've had a soft spot for them ever since my tweens. And, uh, and, and that should be obvious to anybody who's read my stuff. I think um, they're, they're just a, a beautiful idea. Um, and they, they solve the problem of propulsion very nicely. That's right. And Jane? Depends on the story. Um, I'll do anything from hand waving to, uh, to thinking a lot about it if, it, if it's important to the story. In one of my early novels, it was really necessary for a human to get between planets, but human, the humans didn't have the technology. So the character had to go into something that had been designed for an alien. And it was a uncomfortable, but you know, she had to get from point A to point B and, and did it. So um, going back to what Becky said, you know, think about what your story needs mm -hmm. and, and use, use that as your baseline. And I view the same way for say, Space travel. 
uh, if it, I, I'd love to do a generation ship saga sometime. That's a really cool idea. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to say, because I want to write that story, I'm never going to write anything with wormholes or, or asteroid miners or whatever. Mm -hmm. Very good. So I think we are out of time. Do we have one more time for question for one more or not? No, no, I, I think we are out of time. So thank you panelists for uh, this great discussion. I learned too much about fungus and I'm going to have nightmares. Uh, but uh, I hope speaking of fungus that everyone sticks around for the green slime awards coming up at seven. Uh, and then of course we'll have closing ceremonies right after that. So thanks everyone. Thank you folks. Thanks you were Bye. 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 Mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> mushrooms, mushrooms.